You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for May 11th, 2018. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where our motto is, please direct all questions to outside counsel. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. And first up, we want to thank Bob Seska for having us on his show and also welcome all Bob Seska listeners to our show. We're all one big happy family. We are indeed. Um, one of these fine days, we're going to have Bob Seska on this show. Uh, we're going to get a, another orange crate for him mm-hmm. and another string and a Dixie cup. And we're going to have him sit his his ass down and, and have a long and fruitful discussion about whatever he wants to talk about because he was very generous and uh, we had a wide-ranging and really fun conversation. Yes, yesterday. we did. I, I just have a blast talking to, to Bob, and uh, I know his listeners are uh, – a lot of his listeners overlap with ours. And well, You guys are two peas in a pod anyway, but yeah. uh, and, and funny together. So I had a good time, and it was, a, it was just a, a great show, and uh, we do appreciate ha- him having us on. Uh, Drift Glass, we have a new sponsor, I understand, this week. Oh, we actually have three new sponsors. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we have actually three, three count of three new sponsors. At this point, uh, we are uh, being told by our lawyers we cannot be specific about who they are because it's still under negotiation. But I can say, I'm free to say that we have uh, we're entered into negotiation with a major telecommunications company, <laughs> an international pharmaceutical company, and a Korean aerospace company uh, who are all coming on board with very generous fake ad buys. Uh, in exchange for what they call our unique insight into how Republicans think. So, in other words, I we think, get to sit in a meeting for one time and do nothing and rake in hundreds yeah. of thousands of fake dollars. Is that right? Yeah. Uh-huh. This is our last show. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do that after this because uh, we're applying the Michael uh, Cohen model, which is uh, we will give you one shitty meeting. You will learn that we are going to be of no value to you, but you're going to make sure you clear all our checks anyway. Right. And pay us off anyway. This is not our so, last show, folks. We're not no, doing not that John show. Oliver trick no. of pretending it's our last show and then it isn't. But I tell you, <laughs> one with, with one sweep of the Michael Cohen, if we did what Michael Cohen did in a week, uh, we could pay off our mortgage. Yep. Uh, I, we could buy uh, that little uh, motel, that Route 66 Heritage Motel mm-hmm. that I want to buy to turn into a writer's colony. Yeah. Uh, get something nice for my mom. Uh, you know, and, 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 and this was what was so depressing this week for me personally, was mm-hmm. watching the money and how much money was rolling in for a guy just because he's a white guy who knows Donald Trump. And then they're going to cut the chip program. Right. You know, right. and and risk my children's health insurance and my ability my ability to pay for my own health insurance is I'm going into debt to do it. That's really what's happening right now. I've written, a, I've drafted a letter to my senator. Uh, I've uh, appeal. We are appealing with healthcare.gov to get uh, open enrollment, and it's it's very complicated, and uh, it's a mess. But to have then uh, our face rubbed in it that there is there are hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars to be thrown at a bag man for nothing in corporate mm-hmm. America. Don't anybody ever tell me, uh, oh, universal health care, how do we pay for it? Fuck you. There is money to flush in corporate America. There is money to well, flush. They are sitting on piles of cash. This is not, this is moving ones and zeros around and not allowing people to hoard money. We can do anything we want. Well, I, I, since you're, Depressed and sad about uh, uh, billionaire scumbags uh, looting the U.S. Treasury. This story will undoubtedly cheer you up. Yeah, it's a lovely story from the great state of Nevada, where a guy named Shelly Sheldon Adelson, Adelson uh, who who was uh, uh, Newt Gingrich's steak horse, the man who just uh, would write a check anytime Newt Gingrich opened his mouth and made any sniffing motions in the direction of the presidency, uh, who runs casinos, who have bought his hometown newspaper in Nevada just so he could make them write uh, horrid right wing screeds who is an all-around scumbag, top to bottom, left to right, uh, and a multi, multi, multi billionaire and one of the biggest contributors to the Republican Party. Uh, Shelley Adelson uh, recorded, his company recorded a $670 million 
That's almost a billion, $670 million income tax windfall from the GOP tax uh, change in the law in the first quarter. In the first quarter. And in exchange for putting billions of dollars into his pocket and blowing up the Iran deal and moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem where he wants it, and apparently it's only going to cost $150,000, which is pretty cool. Uh, I, again, I think they're just going to slap a, a new new plaque on the consulate, but it's going to get all the it's going to get all the born again Christians into heaven, and uh, Shelley Edelson's going to be happy. And well, I think so- they're just going to slap a, a new name on the embassy suites. Blue Girl. I think they're going to keep look cost low <laughs> and pass the savings along to Shelley because yeah. Shelley could use seriously, those dollars. Um, and in exchange for which, uh, Shelley Edelson just dropped a thirty million dollar check into the coffers of the House GOP Super PAC, which is triple what he gave the group last time. Well, and, and um, Paul Ryan was in the building, but not in the room when he did that. He walked out into oh, the hallway nice. and waited because that's it's nice. not uh, kosher. I hate to use that word, but it's not kosher mm-hmm. for him to ask for a seven-figure donation to a Super PAC. So, because in he's an elected for, official, so he yeah. left the room, and then Shelley got an ask and wrote the check. So... Yeah. Well, and also he keeps his knee pads at the house gym uh, where and he's going to need them uh, for his final days as a an elected representative and the speaker of the house. Because, uh, yeah, Paul Ryan leaving is just, you know, good news, but it really is just, yeah, there'll be another one right behind him. It'll be uh, well, and maybe it, Paul be, Ryan will go to work for that super PAC. You never know. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but it really is. It's, it's a straight up. I'll write you a thirty million dollar check, and you're going to give me a billion dollars every quarter, uh, and do what the fuck I tell you to do with foreign policy because that's how we roll mm-hmm. here. Because we have invented a political party that is absolutely says money equals morality. The more you have, the better you are, and you can see that in their treatment of the poor. Because on the flip side of this. Um, as you know, the uh, the chip program, uh, they're trying to defund the chip program. The White House is trying to uh, pull back seven billion dollars from the Children's Health Insurance Program. You know, to pay for the giant tax cut for Shelley. You Adelson. know who made me feel better about this this week, Drift Glass? Though uh, Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Chuck Schumer was in front of a press gaggle, and he usually doesn't make me feel better, generally speaking. But uh, he did a pre- they did a press gaggle, and they asked about that. And Chuck Schumer said, yeah, you know, the Mick Mulvaney wing of the Republican Party doesn't do appropriations. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. And, and the way he talked about our approps, you know, we don't even, if they want to mess around with our approps, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. But I don't think they want to do that. And he was basically saying, you know, uh, if you want the military industrial complex and all your rich friends in Virginia to get their checks, uh-huh. uh, don't start throwing in children's health care negotiations at this point yeah. because you're going to be sorry. Yeah. Uh, so he did make me feel a little better after I had just said, I'm leaving Twitter tonight because seeing everyone – uh, analyzing and trying to figure out where millions of dollars that wound up in Michael Cohen's uh, LLC account uh, came from and was changing hands and so forth. While I'm saying, what if we lose our children's health insurance? What, how am I going to pay for my health insurance? And and all of that, it was just depressing. It just was really depressing. So, uh, and and that doesn't even count talking about the Iran deal getting torched, which yeah. is a blatant excuse for the John Boltons of the of the White House to start another war in the Middle East. So, uh, you know, there's it's bad news all around. I did feel better with Chuck Schumer. Mm-hmm. I also felt better, ironically, when uh, Dick Cheney came on my television. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. But are you okay, it, honey? It, really? Are you, it, if you need to no, lay down, it, you just... it made me feel as though, oh, wow, you know what? Kurt Vonnegut really is writing this story. Yeah. And he started with chapter one back with, you know, the Nixon administration, back with uh Barry Goldwater. He's 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 gonna going back all the way to chapter one, and he's going to gather up all of the loose threads of this very long novel and there isn't going to be a single thing, a single 
crime that was done by the Republican Party that will not be revealed mm -hmm. and hopefully justice be brought to the, all of this. Well, that, that does depend a lot on us. It does. But it de it you know it depends on all of us voting. It depends on all of us act being active in uh, calling this out and not allowing both siderism to paint it over. But when Dick Cheney appeared on television, of all the things that he did, you know, if I was Dick Cheney, Rick Glass, which you should be glad yeah, I'm no, not. No, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I have had that dream, and I I needed a lot of drinks to uh, get me off the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. But I would hide my head in shame for the rest of my life. I wouldn't appear on television again. I wouldn't, uh, and I certainly wouldn't double down on, oh yeah, enhanced integration is a great thing. I think we should have it all the time. A whole bunch of people on Twitter said, yeah, you first, Dick. Well, and, and <laughs> this, is, this is my... But he, but he has no shame. Well, he has no shame. Well, and he has a safe place in Fox yeah. to go on and say his war criminal shit and get a nod from a blonde. Well, he, you know? he needs constant infusions of blood and human organs to keep <laughs> moving. So he's perfectly okay with torture for, for that reason alone. Um, and, and this, this does go all go back to a common theme that we have talked about on this podcast many times, which is no one was ever held accountable for the Bush administration. Right. All the rats were allowed to scamper into the, into the, into the, uh, Wayne Scotting scamper into the, into the, uh, the, the walls and stay there and then come out during the uh, Trump administration. They were all, none of them were punished. None of them were. And, and this, this is the thing. I really do think Barack Obama was trying to, I think he's, he, uh, history has shown that he was tragically mistaken, but he really did think that this purple American nonsense that we could that, look, you guys fucked up so badly. So many, every way you can fuck up, you did. You, you lied us into the wrong war. You fucked that war up. You tortured people. You lost an entire city in New Orleans. Um, you, you, you bugged people. You left the economy in ruins behind you. you. And you lied and lied and lied and lied. And goddamn Bush, you know, Cheney was your vice president. You, you guys were an embarrassment from, from start to finish. And all the people who cheered these people on, all the people who called us all traitors and liars and un-American during those, those long, dark Bush years, I'm going to give you a mulligan. And then we're all going to go forward as if we're adults and we're going to pass health care. And then, and we're, or we're going to work together to solve problems. Do right. you remember Drift Glass, that meeting that he had with senators and congressmen? Which, which he held like a parliamentary government. Oh no, it was it was the Republican retreat. It was the Republican, was the retreat, Republican retreat, but it turned into and they invited it turned him. into and and who was who was moderating the conversation? Paul Ryan. You remember? Paul Ryan. Mike but, Pence. Oh, that's right. It was Mike Pence. You're absolutely right. Mike Pence. It was Mike Pence, uh -huh. and uh, he was moderating, and they he took command of the stage. He did. Asked for ideas, got ideas from John McCain on doing this, this X, Y, and Z thing. And then Mike Pence asked this crazy question about uh, when are we going to have uh, across the board tax cuts for working families and family farms? And, and Barack Obama just said, well, you know, Mike, uh, I'd love to see your numbers on that. Yeah, well, that was, that was <laughs> the answer to every question. If now, you I, have I, numbers that work. I'm willing to work with you. They invited him to their retreat in Baltimore. He went. Which they never did again. And they yep. never did it again. So this was the retreat in Baltimore uh, that no one on the right remembers. All they remember is Barack Obama shoved this crap down our throat and he wouldn't let us do anything. And he made us blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. Republicans yep. did a hundred and I don't know, 20, 80, some huge number of amendments. Uh, mm -hmm. Democrats wouldn't let them put poison pill amendments in there to kill the thing. Barack Obama arrived at the table with the Republican plan, with the American Enterprise plan, with the Romney plan, and said, this is how far I'm willing to go to meet you. I'm willing to disappoint the, the single-payer people. I'm willing to screw over the uh, Medicare for all people. I'm willing to even take the government option off the table. But you have – I don't care who owns this. I don't, I don't want my name on it if you don't want it. If, it, if that's what it takes to pass this, just, just take my name off it. But you have to give me a better solution to the – basic problem of there are 40 million people uninsured in this country. There are more people who are underinsured than you would possibly imagine. And prices keep going up and up and up uncontrollably. Solve those three problems. and I'll, I'll go out there and lobby for your bill. Just do it already. And they told mm -hmm. him to go fuck himself. 
Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. They, the problem with the whole Obama approach was you can't give a mulligan to sociopaths. Yeah. They don't learn yeah. anything. Right. All they learn right. is, oh, I gotta, right. you mean if I just fuck up bad enough, you'll give, you'll let me off the hook? Because uh, that's what everyone in the media is guilty of. With a very few rare exceptions, they let these people walk. When, when these people all put on funny hats and became tea partiers and swore mm-hmm. they never heard of George Bush, the media looked the other way and let them get away with it. Because the minute people start being held accountable for their behavior during the Bush administration, a whole lot of people, starting with David Gregory and Chuck Todd and David Brooks and Bill Crystal, all become unemployable for the rest of their fucking lives. And those are people who go to Andrea Mitchell's t- uh, cocktail parties and who right. are all friends with each other. So we can't let that happen. So we can't actually hold anyone accountable for the shit they did. So we'll just pretend it never happened. Well, now this is the blowback from that. Putting right. up torture. Right. And that's what – putting up torture putting and torture having woman. Gina Haspel – say oh no it's not immoral i'll never do it again but it's not immoral what a sociopathic answer and cheney crawling out of the woodwork going you know torture is yeah. actually kind of cool have you ever watched a person be tortured it's really quite amazing um yeah, and, right. and the problem is the the media collectively decided um that no bush dead ender war pimps would ever be held accountable for anything exhibit a david yep. brooks exhibit b bill crystal exhibit c david Frum. Peggy Noonan, Peggy mm-hmm. fucking let's not talk about torture because it's Icky Noonan who, who was on. Uh, what was it? It was uh, this week when mm-hmm. when the photos of Abu Ghraib came out. Her response was, you know, oh, some, it's distasteful. It's, it's, it's distasteful. We, we really need to move we on. We should move on because, yeah. you know, sometimes things need to be mysterious and we need to move on from this. And a great nation. But Drew Glass, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute sure. and just say if Donald Trump was going to select someone who was uh, within the CIA framework and a Republican, yeah. the only pool he has to go to is Bush war criminals. That's it. That's true. So That's true. Uh, he, he could, he could have just chosen, you know, Pammy Atlas. Yeah. <laughs> he could have just chosen yeah. a John Bolton fangirl and tried to yeah. put that through, but really mustache rides. Yeah. But you know, I, I have a feeling this is somebody who Mike Pompeo knows and uh, can work with, which is also a conflict of interest that is beyond discussion. Uh, but you know, if if she's going, if she is uh, the substitute Mike Pompeo, and and is going to be a stalking horse for him, which is what I've heard is the case, uh, then he's going to pick someone like that. And the sociopathic answer, I don't think uh, it's immoral. I'm not going to talk about that, Senator. Uh, She's still going to get confirmed by, I think, by a razor's edge. I think she's going to get it confirmed. And I do too. And, this is, so. and, and, and since we don't have the power to stop this yep. at the moment, right. here's what we do have the power to do. We have the power to learn from the past because, as we've said before, our superpower on the left is our memory. Mm-hmm. That we, we remember the past, we remember the names, we have the receipts, and we're, we're willing to talk about it, which is what makes us exiles from polite society because <laughs> we do talk about it. The the mistake that was made last time was that the complicit media and the Republican Party and a whole bunch of blue dogs and a well-intentioned but naive president were willing to look the other way in exchange for, let's get back to the important business of governing. But the Republican Party has never been about governing. They've been about tearing the government down, looting the place, giving money to Shelley Adelson, shutting the shit down deregulating everything and turning it all over to corporations. That's their mandate. That's what they believe government should look like. So our job this time is to make sure we do not repeat the same mistake that we made last time. The people who were complicit in the rise of Donald Trump, the people who were complicit in building the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't trust the goddamn never Trumpers. Right. right. Because according to them, this all just happened overnight. This literally, I've said that, that the opening paragraph of every never Trump book is going to be right out of metamorphosis. <laughs> I woke up one day and the Republican party was a giant cockroach. Oh my God. Yeah. How did that happen? It's, it's, it, it is. And it's for that reason that I do believe, like you said, there is a, a, a righteous history, a revenge, a, a leavening waiting for these people. And it is obviously the job of the media to be a firewall against judgment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. against these people ever being held accountable. That's why Chuck Todd has a job. The reason Chuck Todd has a job, the reason all these people are present in our media is because their job is to hold back the tide, to make sure that, holy shit, if we ever, if, dude, we'll, we'll, 
you know, we must hang together. I think Franklin said this, hang together or we shall surely all hang separately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, They need to stick together because once the accountability switch is thrown and we start saying, no, wait a minute. No, 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 no. If you were cool with Barack Obama being treated like shit and being being called un-American and a Kenyan and all that that shit that led up to Trump, if you were cool with all that, then you're not on my team. You're just a windsock. You're just Joe Scarborough. You know, the, the whole idea of, oh, who is it? Tammy uh, up in Wisconsin. Tammy Baldwin. Yeah. Tammy yeah. Baldwin. Yeah. Her the, opponent the first... is calling her team terrorist and yes. photoshopping her with Khalid, you know, the, the terrorist who we torture. Yeah. Yeah. She's, uh, the, the, and, and doubling down on it that we're going to, we're going to replay. This is amazing to me. We're going to read, like you said, and the title of our show is It's Always 2003. Democrats are terrorists. So uh, that's how they plan to uh, stem the blue tide is by saying Democrats are pro-terrorism because they're not pro-torture. And that used to be Rick Wilson's job. Rick Wilson's job. Rick Wilson, right up until Rick Wilson became Anna Anna Marie Cox's best buddy. And decided that Donald Trump was the worst thing that ever, ever happened on the face of God's earth and became a trusted MSNBC on-air personality. Rick Wilson was that guy. Mm-hmm. And, and at no point has Rick Wilson ever apologized for it, ever atoned for it, ever admitted to it, ever acknowledged that he helped build the monster machine that he is now bitching about. And that's – if you want to be on our team, that's all you got to do. But that's a big step. And that means you have to start by acknowledging that you were wrong. I think you it's reported. more than that. I think we can even go deeper than that because the Tammy Baldwin is on team terrorism ad. Rick uh-huh. Wilson knows who made that ad. Of course he does. He should be of outing that does. person. He should be making sure that though, whoever is is coarsening our discourse to that extent mm-hmm. is outed and does not work in polite DC politics ever mm-hmm. again. It's time to destroy some careers, folks. Again, let's start with George Will, shall we? Because <laughs> um, George Will apparently is the greatest thing since sliced bread. George Will today, or yesterday, I guess, it's, we're recording this on Friday, uh, wrote a column uh, which is being universally praised as the bravest, greatest, most super awesome thing anyone has ever written about anybody because he called Mike Pence repulsive and a toady and oleaginous. Um and I, I just wrote a little post that said, look, if we're handing out medals of valor for speaking in the voice of a liberal blogger from 2005 and correctly using the word oleaginous, I went through my, uh, my, my, my uh, archives and mm-hmm. found five posts where I'd use that word. <laughs> and, and I just pulled them up, said, well, shit, I'm a liberal blogger. I've been blogging. I've been using that voice. That is my actual voice. That is not the one I adopted because that is what the market demand that I do uh, as opposed to being completely left aside. So George Will, who is a human windsock who will blow in any direction anyone pays him to blow in, suddenly discovered that bagging on uh, Donald Trump and bagging on Mike Pence uh, is a good dollar. It, mm-hmm. It'll get you on the Lawrence O'Donnell show. So he wrote a long ass Mike Pence is a monster and he's weaselly and he's awful that could have come from any liberal blogger I know any point in the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't count because we're liberals and liberals are not allowed to be right. We're not allowed to be on television. We're not allowed to have our voices heard. All we can do is watch George fucking Will rip off our adjectives, <laughs> rip off our critique and and go out and and be prosper and, and be plod- applauded for it, be patted on the back for it. The same. This is the same George Will. This is not a different George Will. This is the same George Will who's hated us all these years, mm-hmm. who is who's attacked liberals relentlessly, who, who was on Fox News. And remember, he was a Fox News contributor, yep. yeah. and he was a loyal Fox News contributor right up until uh, his gag reflex kicked in, and then he became a loyal MSNBC contributor. But there, there is no accountability for the shit he wrote yesterday. At no point is Lawrence O'Donnell going to hold up a column from George Will from three years ago and say, George. What about this shit you were being paid to write back then? Were you were you just stupid? Were you drunk? Uh, and, and that's that's the conversation that our media is designed to make sure never happens. Because like like any, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, like any nuclear reactor or nuclear reaction is a critical mass, and that critical mass cannot be allowed to accumulate in front of the camera. So we can't be allowing liberals who have the receipts to be sitting across from say Steve Schmidt 
uh, when Steve Schmidt is is we were all invited to watch the Nicole Wallace show today on the Twitter uh, because Steve Schmidt's really going to light into that 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 person who attacked John McCain. Boy, he's just going to take him to task, and the Steve Schmidt rant's going to be fucking epic. I'm like, you know what? Oh, and Steve Schmidt is good at ranting. He's he's, he's a gifted speechwriter sure and advertising is. executive, so he knows sure. how to do that. And I, gotcha. I just so Nicole, yeah, Nicole Wallace invited us all to watch Steve Schmidt, you know, bag on that. And all I wanted to know was, um, I'd much rather see him weigh in on what the hell he was thinking during the decades long and very public devolution of his party to the point where such depravities are commonplace. Was he heavily medicated? Was he clueless or did he just <laughs> not care? And that's a con- that's a really interesting conversation. Uh, if we want to have those edgy conversations, those deep conversations, those no holds barred, dark web uh, conversations about subjects that people don't want to talk about, let's have that conversation. Let's talk about where the fuck were you during all the years your party was turning into this monster that you now deplore because you worked for them. You were taking money from them. That was your only job. You weren't plumbing. You weren't laying bricks. You weren't putting asphalt on streets. You were working for a party that we could all see clearly was heading in this direction. That was perfectly okay with you right up until Donald Trump came down the escalator. At what point do you lose your credibility to have an opinion on politics? Because either you have to be completely mercenary to be that sort of person or completely clueless. Either one of which disqualifies you from having an opinion about politics for the rest of your life. That's a conversation I'd love to have. That's a conversation we could have. But that's the conversation our media is designed to prevent from happening at all costs. So. I think, too, there's a couple things to add to that mix. One is no one, and I mean no one in any perspective, of any political perspective, really understood how much the Russians had us by the neck. Also true. Uh, that said, two things. One is the Republican Party engaged in voter suppression. They did. Which is inexcusable. And number two, the Republican Party is utterly complicit with keeping this monster in office. Yes, they certainly are. And those two things make them responsible. And I want to talk to them. And if, you know, if we're giving truth serum out and saying, you know, Rick Wilson or whoever you are, Republican strategists. Uh, to what extent was your job to fool the rubes into voting for a stable candidate? Right. A John candidate McCain. that corporate America would approve. Mm-hmm. And uh, and how and how, you know, all of the dog whistles that you use to make sure that the Republican voter would step in line when what they really wanted was a racist, white supremacist, racist, sexist Donald Trump in the White House. Mm -hmm. And they finally had had enough of you fooling them uh, into voting for corporations' choice, the Jeb Bushes or the Marco Rubios. They didn't want uh, to take that safe choice anymore. They wanted their candidate who, you know, Talk the way I'm thinking. We'll, we'll call it. <laughs> let's refer to this from now on as race bait and switch. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's what they've been doing for since since the days of Lee, since George race H. bait and <laughs> switch is right, yeah. and and it's not that they were corrupting us as voters. No, it's that they were full that their <laughs> three card money with their own party mm-hmm. failed. This was their failure. They ran out of. Uh, suspension of disbelief right. with their own voters. Right. And you can see this in the candidacy of, of John McCain. I'm not mm-hmm. going to say anything bad about John McCain at the moment. I, you know, I've said all, the, all I have to say about John McCain on my blog, and I'm not taking a word of it back. But John McCain in 2000 called Jerry Falwell an agent of, of corruption or catastrophe or whatever. It was. He, he, he was very clear about that. By 2008, he had it beaten into him that if you want to win this election, John, you better get down to Liberty University and kiss Jerry Falwell's ass, which is exactly what he did. And you better put exactly what he did. And he went on did an ad on build the dang wall, the dang which wall. he knew was impossible to do. Right. And then he put Sarah Palin on the ticket. So it's not yeah. like John McCain or anyone else in the Republican Party in any capacity of leadership is unaware of what their base is really like, or how they got that way, or the or the deep debt they owe to Sean Hannity and and Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly and all of Fox News. 
and Ann Coulter and all the rest of them for for making priming the ground, spending decades turning the Republican base into the monster machine that it is. We right. all know that. So the question, as always, is the same, which is, were you OK with it then? Because they were paying you and you're a mercenary or and you have no soul, in which case, why am I listening to you? Or were you just incredibly stupid? In which case, why am I listening to you? And that would be a very brief and, I think, exciting conversation to have. <laughs> but you know what? Look, hey, Drift, let's, let's do a news roundup, shall we? I, I want to mention one more thing, and then we'll do the news roundup. Um, oh, you want to mention both siderism, right? We, both sides? We do, because uh, you've been tracking some of the keywords. Now that both siderism is getting uh, kind of kicked around the block a little bit, uh, now that— I have. I've been tracking some keywords. I've been tracking Trumpism, of uh-huh. course. Uh, both sides, which is— both sides is a really tough one to track because both sides appears in advertising a lot yeah. and uh, sports. And so if you're tracking the the just the cable incidences of both sides, you get a lot you just get a lot of hits. And it's not always both siderism. Uh, but Trumpism is a very unique word yep. <laughs> that you can search on. And Trumpism bursts out like a zit when something really bad is happening in the Republican Party. The day that uh, Paul Ryan said he was going to leave office. Uh, Trumpism exploded. The conversations around Trumpism exploded because, you know, if a Republican like Paul Ryan can't survive the Republican Party, does that mean Trumpism has take over, taken over the Republican Party? And keeping Trumpism as a completely separate uh, yet co-joined at the moment uh, quality to the Republican Party, but keeping it just separate enough so you can rip off that Band-Aid uh, and say, oh, no, it was never a part of you. <laughs> you know, uh, just rip that sticker off because that's just Trumpism. The real Republican Party is underneath. Uh, and that's what they were doing with this Paul Ryan thing. And that's that is they're out is it's not Republicans. It's Trumpism. Well, it's not. Uh, the other ones is partisanship. I'm looking up. I'm looking for incidences of partisan you know the partisanship on both sides is just so it's all poisonous bad. it's and tribalism tribalism is a big one and tribalism is the other one yep tribalism oh, and partisanship and i'm an independent blue gal mm-hmm. yeah you have to, again that's one where you will then pick up all of the independent studies show right. that zarelto or whatever drug they're trying to mm-hmm. sell you'll get a lot of instances of that word you're looking for unique hits so trumpism works partisanship you don't get as much uh but things like both sides even like i said that's in sport espn has both sides going all the time so if you'd like a little late breaking paul ryan news oh, I, no, really? I can reliably report that no he's still in office uh, according to the washington post the real reason paul ryan is blocking a vote to protect the dreamers is he, mm-hmm. he knows it would pass and it would force donald trump to veto it Oh God! And, and that was revealed apparently during Donald Trump's very angry tirade against his Homeland Security chief. Yeah. That's the real oh reason. The real reason is not that it would fail, not that it's a bad idea, but it would pass. And it would make Donald Trump look bad because he'd have to veto it. And Paul Ryan is a tool, an absolute soulless, dead-eyed tool of the forces oh, that Donald create. Donald Trump Absolutely. It's not Trumpism. It's the Republican Party. And this is why the media is complicit because they – when, when, as I just said, Paul Ryan decided he wasn't going to run for a re-election to the House, Trumpism. Is it Trumpism now that Paul Ryan can't even survive this Republican Party? He's in on it, folks. Uh, we wanted to give some kudos, right? Uh-huh. Yes, indeed. To Jason Kander. Yes, uh, He's with an organization uh, called Let America Vote, and he yeah. was on Chris Hayes Thursday night. Uh-huh. Uh, opposite a uh, gentleman from who was a veteran of the Marco Rubio campaign, which yes. I thought was hilarious because yeah. Marco Rubio is uh, the quintessential both siders, you know, both sides of the aisle. That's his his recorded answer to any time he gets pushed in the corner. Well, back in 2012, he got brutally worked over by John Stewart mm-hmm. and said both sides as the answer to every question like a dozen times in a row. 31 yeah, times. It was, it was <laughs> just embarrassing. And his uh, his his student uh, who studied at the field of the master, a guy named uh, Lan He Chen, mm-hmm. uh, was on the TV machine just yesterday. And he tried to run that shit and he got stopped cold. He got asked that absolutely cold. Well, it was about Sheldon Adelson. Yeah, it was. Adelson writing a $30 million check. And, 
you know, the money in politics is bad and, you know, it really is on both sides. And Jason Kander said, look, he's done a really good job of getting both sides into this conversation three times. Let me just say one thing. Both sides don't think this is ridiculous. Democrats have to play by these rules because this is the rules of the game. And if they don't, they'll be flattened. But one side is trying to get these rules undone and to undo Citizens United. And one side does think this amount of money in politics is a bad thing. And I'm proud to be on that side of the equation. Mm -hmm. So this both siderism is nonsense. And And even Chuck Todd, even Chuck Todd. (laughs) <laughs> Just finally choked on it the other day. Yep. Uh, there was a guy named Brad, no relation, Todd, uh, who looks like <laughs> Chuck Todd 10 years ago before the the madness set in, um, uh, who was trying to compare Bill Clinton to the, the Russian oligarchs. You know, well, the Clinton Foundation, this and that. And Chuck Todd just busted out with the whataboutism drives me nuts. Now, for future <laughs> generations, the king of whataboutism, the guy who's built his fucking career on never holding Republicans accountable for anything, always answering with, but yeah, what about the Democrats? Is Chuck Todd. Yeah. So the idea that the yeah. emperor, the king of all whataboutisms, would finally go, wait a minute, wait a minute, is kind of encouraging, which is which is why they have to shift over to, to I'm an independent, it's tribalism, it's partisanship, and it's really Trumpism. It's really Trumpism. It's not me. I was on board with this whole never Trump thing, you know, hours ago. And so I should definitely be able to keep my job. Um, it's it and watching it from our perspective is both depressing and deeply educational because we've been, this is why the title of our podcast is it's always 2003, because this is exactly what happened in the Bush administration chapter and verse. It's much, much worse this time, but it is exactly the same dynamic playing out this, this incestuous, unhealthy, creepy relationship between the complicit press and the Republican party. And let's all make sure that nobody loses a job over this. Let's cover up the monster thing that's happening in the middle. We'll, we're going to blame it on someone else. We're going to wait till it goes away. We're going to talk about how both sides are to blame, and we'll move on with our lives because none of this really affects us. If you cut ship, that won't affect anybody's uh, job or children on television. Um, massive tax cuts are not going to hurt anybody on television. It's going to help them. None of this shit affects them. So it can all be a big game to them. But to us, it's real. And so when we hear that Donald Trump is refusing to mm-hmm. negotiate Medicare prices, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's real to us. That's real to a lot of people. Means- that's real to a lot of his supporters, too. And that's, that's the amazing thing, that if he apparently can hold a rally with a drug uh, manufacturer CEO next to him and pretend he's doing something when he's not. And I want to say something. I know I've said this before. The populist Donald Trump analysis of drug prices, I actually agree with. Yeah. Which is that the United States with their for-profit not negotiating drug prices for Medicare system does tend to subsidize other countries who have a sane system of negotiating drug prices for their national health. If we had universal health care, true universal health care in the United States, and negotiated drug prices, I could totally see us, uh, you know, giving some muscle to the United Nations and saying, we're going to have an international uh, arrangement where we all work together as one massive worldwide movement to make sure that everyone has access to drugs, to make sure they're affordable in the countries where you are, and to negotiate those prices accordingly, based on GDP, based on however you want to do it. But Let's get together internationally and make sure that medical research is funded, that drug prices are at a reasonable cost to consumers, and uh, no one's punished. You know, no one is paying more than they should or less than they should. Let's work together to do that. When you have the United States having the screwed up healthcare system that they do and not doing anything about it and, and having the screwed up political system they, d- they do with money and politics, where Big Pharma decides how the entire Congress votes, regardless of the party, yeah. Yeah. on healthcare policy, then we are c- talking apples and oranges. And to say, well, you know, these other countries are taking us for a ride 
we chose that. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and if we didn't, if we don't fix that, we have no right to say anything about it. Well, That's we, my point. We've lost. I mean, we used to believe in collective bargaining in this country. Yeah. We used to believe well, that. And, and I want to say, um, excuse me. Sure. Uh, Stephanie Rule this morning couldn't believe it that, you know, look, Walmart can negotiate drug prices, but the federal government can't because money and policy. And if you yeah. want cap, I mean, if you actually want capitalism to work at all, you have to mm -hmm. use the government. The government has to be strong enough to keep it in check. That's just, there's no way around that. Right. If you don't, right. capitalism will simply overwhelm the government. It'll buy it, it'll rot it, it'll rip it out by its roots, which is exactly what's happening now. And That's you'll what have we're unregulated, yeah. laissez faire race to the bottom, screw everyone but me, capitalism, ruling everything on principle. You'll have a whole bunch of people like Paul Ryan lined up going, no, that's the way it should be. That, you know, We should have millions and millions of starving, destitute, desperate people in this country because capitalism, and that's the way John Galt would want it. Right, right. But if you want to use markets as your method of distributing goods and services and, and making a living, the government has to set floors on things and they have to put guardrails up around things. And we have to be able to tell the world that we're not going to pay auto workers any less than uh, $30 an hour, $20 an hour for job X or job Y. We're not going to let Tennessee compete with Illinois in a race to the bottom. Well, and internationally, we're not going to compete right. with Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian workers deserve a living wage they as sure well. Do. Yes, they do. So let's work this out. But universal health care uh, is number one because that's how people literally live and die. And if we can't and negotiate, we're being blackmailed and held hostage with our lives yeah. over the health care issue. Yeah. Buy it or you die means they can charge any price they want. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do some roundup news. Yeah. Uh, the Iran deal was torched because Donald Trump wants to undo the entire Obama yes, legacy. He and he is surrounded by people in the White House who want an excuse for war with Iran. So let's just let them build nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Right. Then we have an excuse for bombing and, and invading. We, as we okay. talked about on the Seska show, uh, Donald Trump understands reality TV. And he understands and, – and, yeah. and the Iran deal is the um, Trump University of Foreign Policy. Uh, yeah. it, it can be hollow yep. and horrible and a ripoff and a complete sham. But as long as it, as long as it looks to the 34 percent of this country who believe he's a god, that he's checking off a box and fill, fulfilling a campaign promise, as long as the packaging is shiny – then they don't care. Then anything that goes wrong with it must be someone else's fault because Donald Trump doesn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Probably those liberals, probably John Kerry, but certainly not Donald Trump. And that's how they keep their party intact. Mm -hmm. Shit like this. Yep. And and we are grateful that the three Americans were released in North Korea. Uh, we are uh, shaking our heads that the victory of negotiations is that the summit will not be held at Mar-a-Lago between Kim and Trump. Yeah, uh, and I don't foresee this uh, coming out with any grand negotiations. First of all, uh, the reason that we haven't sat down with Kim has to do with human rights. And if we don't mention human rights yeah. every time you mention North Korea, which Donald Trump thinks Kim was very wonderful to these prisoners and uh, is a great guy and so forth and so on. Uh, if we are not standing up for human rights in North Korea and around the world, we're not the United States of America. We're some other country. And that's what Donald Trump has taken away from us. And that's what the Republican Party is enabling. Rudy Giuliani continues to be amazing. He told his uh, white shoe law firm two weeks ago, you know, I got to just leave for a couple weeks. It, it's like a vacation. I'm just going to go down and talk to Bob Mueller and get this whole Russia thing worked out. And then I'll be right back. I have a feeling that this is what Giuliani told his first wife. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to take an apartment downtown and just be gone for a while. And then eventually he announced on TV they were getting a divorce. And she said, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except this time is his law firm basically said no. Yeah. Uh no. I don't know who this lunatic is, but he don't work for us no more. But it was it was yet another opportunity for where the good lord split you emergency party planning services. Mm -hmm. Our fake sponsor is willing to make a cake for any law firm that needs to get rid of an embarrassment like Rudy yeah. Giuliani. Yeah, there's a sheet cake out there with Rudy Giuliani's name on it and it says just go. Donald Trump doesn't <laughs> understand much but he does uh, he understands the beats of television, the how yeah. Yeah. the rhythm of 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 uh reality TV. So he can't fired Giuliani today. No, right, uh, right. He's clearly hired a person who doesn't know when to shut the fuck up and always says the wrong thing in front of the wrong people. 
And that used to be, you know, <laughs> Donald, that's Donald Trump's job. And as we said last week, that's a factor of age. It, is. it happens a lot in this White House. Mm-hmm. John Kelly on NPR that, you know, uh, it's not that the illegal immigrants are criminal. They're not all MS fi- MS-15 or MS-13 or whatever. Uh, but they're rural and uneducated right. and won't assimilate. Right. John Kelly. Not, not noticing the people that elected Donald Trump. Well, not noticing John <laughs> Kelly is a awfully Irish sounding name there, you mean, John. You mean uh, that, that he may have come from pota- uneducated potato famine refugees? Uh, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. that might have happened. And the idea that, well, we're not going to separate the, the, fa- the children. I mean, they'll be put in foster homes or whatever. It's yeah, this, or it's whatever. This, Really, and that kind that's of... not a threat. He he did acknowledge that that was a deterrent. To yeah, if you if you come here and you're undocumented, we're going to kidnap your children. Is a deterrent again, not the United States of America, not the country that I am proud of. Uh, and we got to get rid of these people. Yeah. And I just I just wish that old white, slightly bigoted, at least in in, in the best light, slightly bigoted. Mm-hmm. Uh, Republican men would just shut up. Just shut it up. would make everything just so much up. better. Just shut up. Well, I look like one of them, so I'll pass the message along. Uh, I'll um, pass on the word. Speaking of uh, white guys who are who should go away, Michael Cohen, his world, the the, the amazing world of Michael Cohen, just gets is getting so bad so fast. Tell us how, and tell tell us all of well, it. Well, a million dollars from a Vexelberg Columba, uh, Vexelberg's Columbus Nova. Uh, that's a Russian oligarch with close ties to Vladimir Putin. Uh, who was on the list of sanctioned Russians, uh, gave him a million dollars. And then AT&T uh, paid him $200,000 in four, four installments uh, for insights into Donald Trump, uh, which is, uh, they suddenly, re- apparently today or yesterday, they said, uh, that was really bad. We shouldn't have done that. Uh, of course, all the checks cleared. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, Novartis yeah. paid this asshole $1.2 million because apparently he's a pharmaceutical regulatory expert all of a sudden. Uh, no, he's he's Saul Goodman. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's a criminal, and they what they wanted to do was buy their way into regulatory reform. AT and T wanted to buy their way into telecommunication regulatory reform, and and uh, Michael Cohen was walking around apparently on Fifth Avenue with a sandwich board, going, you know, we'll lobby for money, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which you're allowed to do if you register as a lobbyist, but he didn't do that. So people just were wandering past his office, giving uh, uh, more and more money to his. Let's not forget how this started. His porn star hush money slush fund. And that was apparently a great place to stash a whole bunch of other money, including Korean aerospace, who would like aerospace contracts from us. I I believe, Blue Gal, if we got half of this Mm -hmm. for doing exactly the same job that Michael Cohen did, which is nothing, which is taking one shitty meeting and then the AT&T people or the Novartis people suddenly realize we have no idea what we're talking about, but we're going to pay you anyway because screw it. It's just funny money anyway. I'll do nothing for them for $1,700 a month. That's yeah. what we're paying for the health insurance yeah. premium for both of us. I'll, I'll do, I'll, I can be bought. Well, for, I will do nothing for you for $1,700 a for, month. For half of what Michael Cohen did for delivering nothing, you and I could pay okay. off our mortgage, pay the health care, Put the kids through college, yep. and I could finally buy that Route 60, Route sixty six Heritage Motel mm-hmm. and turn it into a writer's colony for the Midwest. Yeah, um, yeah. Buy something nice for my mom and do a whole bunch of other good things for my community. Yeah, there was a right wing commentator, I believe it was that uh, Brad Todd guy who was talking to Chuck Todd, Todd, who made the excuse that Columbus Nova is is an American company. It's owned and run by an American, so you really can't talk about foreign influence when it's run by an American. No. The American is Andrew Intrader. Uh, he's Victor Vexelberg's cousin. My cousin. My cousin <laughs> from Canada runs the place. I don't know nothing about nothing. No, his, his American citizen cousin who got the citizenship. You know, how did he, get, how did he buy that? Uh, his American citizen cousin is on paper the owner and operator of Columbus Nova. So yeah, no, no problem there. But he felt safe lying about it because nobody could figure that out. No detective right. could ever no. sort of <laughs> suss out that kind of connection. It would take a genius to. Uh, I'm, I'm, Robert Miller's uh, going to be going. Well, it looks like an American, so we're just going to leave this alone. I, just let, yeah, we'll just set that aside. And, and this no, is the problem with no. the entire thing. The lies are all calibrated for the stupidest people in the country because they're mm-hmm. the only people they care mm-hmm. about. And we're all going, do yeah. you see this? Do you see this? They're literally playing their their poker hands with the cards up. We can literally see what you're doing. 
but it doesn't matter because we're not the audience. That was Rod yeah. Rosenstein. He's like, the, the House Intelligence Committee can't stop leaking their own memos. Anyway, Mike Pence... Uh, has decided, in the words of Richard Nixon, it's time to wrap up wrap this up. investigation wrap because it it's been a year. I just want to remind everyone mm -hmm. that the attack on us in Benghazi, Libya, happened in September of 2012. And the House Intelligence Committee issued their final report in December of 2016. Now, let me do the math. Let me just give me a second. <laughs> I, I'm not Michael Cohen. I'm not like a brain wizard who can add. Now, I know, I know that the investigation didn't happen the day the attack right. happened. Right. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting but that. Which investigation? Because there were several. Right. There were multiple Republican led investigations into Benghazi because you have to have that flaming building behind the Fox News broadcaster at all times for four years. Now, when is Donald Trump going to testify in open hearings for 11 hours? I'm. Um, like like Hillary Clinton did. When is he going to be? Yeah, on television. Yeah, when is that going to happen? Because that's going to be great. That's going to be great TV. Well, it's going to be great. He he's slurring his words this week, and people are starting to notice again. So that should be really Another interesting. One fact about those Russian linked companies that hired Michael Cohen to do nothing yeah. is they also registered mm -hmm. a whole bunch of alt right websites during the 2016 election. Cool. Because why hide anything? We own the cops, right? We own the police force. Why bother hiding anything anymore? All right, Democrats on the House Intelligence Committee, Democrats released 3,500 Facebook ads purchased by a Russian troll farm from mid-2015 to mid-2017. The ads from the Kremlin-linked Internet Research Agency <sighs> reached at least 146 million people on Facebook and Instagram. I need a drink right now, so uh -huh. let's cruise towards the end of this thing, and I'll pour you a tall Yeah, we're, we're at our time anyway. Well, you know what? Yeah. Let me just point out that John McCain, uh, who is nearing the end of his life, has written in his new book a number of things which are uh, won't surprise anyone on the left, but but is apparently calling sh causing shockwaves. First of all, he's the guy who gave the Steele dossier to the FBI director to James Comey, oh, and he God. said he would do it again um, because it was the right thing to do. He also said it was a mistake to put Sarah Palin on the ticket, and the Iraq War was a mistake as well. So you know what, um, uh, your your impending. Mortality does have a way of sharpening the mind, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'm glad he's writing it down. I think it's all way too late, but yeah, I think I'm glad he's writing it down and, and having some candor yeah. about it too. Yeah, yeah, uh, might might be a lesson to some other people about candor. <laughs> uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton is leading an effort to eliminate the top White House cybersecurity job. This after a report from the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded that Russia conducted an unprecedented unprecedented, coordinated cyber campaign in order to undermine confidence in U.S. voting systems starting as early as 2014 and continuing through Election Day 2016 and beyond. Senators report that the Russians targeted at least 18 states looking for vulnerabilities, and in six states, they tried to gain access to voting websites. In the meantime, John Bolton says, just get rid of that cybersecurity job. We don't need it. You know, that, here's something I'll... I'll I'll give George Bush credit for. Yep. George Bush hired a political hack to run FEMA yep. when we needed a competent professional to run FEMA. And then we lost New Orleans because George Bush was criminally incompetent and hired a hack. But at no point did George Bush ever say, you know, the problem with 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 uh, the hurricanes right. is the existence of FEMA. We should just get rid of FEMA altogether mm -hmm. and something, something, then it'll fix itself. Yep. That He never went that far. So I'll give him credit for acknowledging that an agency – designed to deal with disasters is a good idea even if he did a shitty job of staffing it this is this is the part that just cracks me up you want some good news blue gal yeah rachel crooks won her uncontested primary bid for a seat in the ohio state house of representatives rachel crooks is one of the women who accused donald trump of sexual assault there are a lot of women who have won and you and i had a long conversation about women in power this week uh yeah. Just just talking while I was brushing my teeth and so forth. I wish you'd be, you guys had been there. It was a great conversation. It was. It was. Uh, we we should bring it up again. But part of the, the crux of what I said in that conversation was that uh, women have and and you agreed with me. Women have always done the work in organizations and made things run. And what we've needed to do is we have to take ownership of the power that we have. It's not enough for women to be the power behind the throne. It's not enough for women to do all the work in an organization and not take ownership of the power that comes with it. 
the power is part of the responsibility. And so as we run for office and speak out and put a female face with all of the work that we're doing to make these things run, that's when equality uh, starts to be understood in the zeitgeist of our society. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's on us. Uh, Unfortunately, that's on us to do. No one's going to hand it to us. We have to stand up. We have to run for office. And and we have to show what equality looks like. And we're doing that. So that's awesome. And congratulations to all of the women who won their primaries and are going to, going to continue to win their primaries as we celebrate this blue wave. They'll move on to the general Amen. and they'll win there too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Donald Trump talked about taking away press credentials from media outlets over negative coverage from him. Everyone was outraged about that, and then we just moved on because yes. that's what happens. Oh, he's you know, he's crazy. Um, he just says crazy things. Let's just oh, move on to the next thing. Um, yeah. And finally, Senate Democrats filed a petition to force a net neutrality vote by June 12th. And we need to be paying attention to that vote and counting votes and watching what happens. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Sammy. Sammy is another cousin of our black kitties here at Casa DGBG. He is king of all he surveys, and what he surveys is the windows on a regular basis. Look out the window. Everything out there is mine, just so you know. Go visit Sammy at our Facebook page and website. He's a very beautiful cat. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service, Go Postal Unions, letter on the air, or unless you say otherwise, and that includes emails, we are planning to do a letter show uh, over the Memorial Day weekend. So get your letters and emails into us. We would love to read them. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, even an iced one, even a smoothie, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details, our PayPal address, our postal address, and a bunch of other ways to donate to our show are there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties want everyone to be beast. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.